You're listening to World Class from the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. We bring in-depth expertise on international affairs from Stanford's campus straight to you. I'm your host, Mike McFall, the director of the Freeman Spogli Institute. Today, we have the honor of speaking to Alexei Goncharuk, the former prime minister of Ukraine, and most recently, the Bernard and Susan Lietov visiting fellow here at the Freeman Spogli Institute. He has the distinction of being the youngest prime minister in the history of Ukraine. And during his tenure had initiated a myriad of important reforms aimed at reducing corruption and cronyism in Ukraine. With the situation on the Russia-Ukraine border intensifying, we wanted to speak to the former prime minister about his perspective about what's going on, why it's happening now, and what we can do, what the world can do, what Ukrainians, Europeans, Americans, and hopefully Russians can do uh, to defuse this crisis. So Alexei, welcome to World Class. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. I appreciate it to be, to see you one more time. Well, let's start with some basic framing history. Just for our listeners who don't follow Ukrainian politics and Russian politics as closely as you and I do, give us a sense for, for what is the, the nature of the conflict between Mr. Putin in Ukraine, and, and why all of a sudden is, is there an escalation uh, of tensions? Uh, hundreds of thousands of troops uh, are now amassed on the border. So what's the nature of this conflict and, and why is it escalating now? Uh, Mr. Ambassador, it's a perfect question uh, because I believe that uh, this uh, escalation, this buildup of Russian troops along the Ukrainian border is not a regional conflict. And it's very important to understand the background of this conflict to find the right solution for future. So uh, Ukrainian nation uh, has very complicated history for like many, many, many hundred years, but I don't think we should dig so deep uh, today. Uh, and, but, but it's very important to understand the situation at least for the last 30 years after the uh, Soviet Union was uh, collapsed. Right. After the, uh, yeah, after the collapse of uh, Soviet Union, uh, and actually, Ukrainian nation played a key role in this collapse because for Ukraine, for Ukrainian nation, it was a uh, like very a long history of fight for its independence. Right. And uh, as a result of the uh, of collapse of Soviet Union, uh, we received uh, a lot of uh, uh, independent countries. And Ukraine was a one, the, the even the biggest uh, nation who achieved this independence uh, as a result of uh, this uh, collapse of uh, uh, prison of uh, nations. Right. And uh, Mr. Putin uh, many times said that this collapse uh, uh, was the biggest uh, catastrophe of uh, 20s uh, of the last uh, century, yeah? And for him, uh, this is a tragedy. It's a huge tragedy. Uh, because uh, uh, now, unfortunately, Russia understands itself as a successor, uh, as, a, as a, like, uh, empire one more time after the uh, like Soviet Union. Uh, and for Mr. Putin, it's very important to, uh, of course, to keep control uh, over Kremlin and to uh, control the power in Russia. And the tool he, you, he and his crowd, his criminal, I believe, crowd, uh, used to uh, keep control over the power in Russia is to create a fake narrative about the special path of Russia. Uh, and uh, for them, for Kremlin, for, for his criminal and corrupted crowd, it's very important Russian people to believe that democracy is a weak idea, is a failed idea, and right. democracy doesn't work for Russia at least, uh, or 
or, or at least a region for a region. For Putin, it's very dangerous to have successful democratic countries, especially Slavic countries, especially mostly Orthodox uh, Christian Orthodox countries, especially a country with such a close ties with between nations, between Ukrainian and Russian nations, and obviously uh, these connections we have like we have a lot of like thousands. Uh, of connection on a multiple, on a many layers and many, many different spheres, economy, culture, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. So the, the, the basis for this conflict uh, is conceptual, is a basis, uh, like is a difference in, in this, is, this is a battle between two conceptually different systems. Right. A Sanitarian system and democratic system, because Ukraine and Ukrainian nation, first of all, for last 30 years, uh, uh, like choose the democratic path. And Ukrainian nation decided to be a democracy. And Ukraine now, thanks God, we are democracy. Uh, like with weak institutions, with some problems, with corruption, but still the electoral democracy have a, like fair elections. And this is a great achievement for our nation because if you look around our country, even like Hungary, successful uh, European country, is, this is not a good, sex, uh, a good example now uh, like for democracy. They have a problem with it. Right. Turkey, have a problem. Belarus, they have a problem. Kazakhstan, they have. So a lot of countries around Ukraine have uh, a problems with uh, the democratic past. And Ukraine, uh, despite all complicated circumstances, is a democracy. And for Putin, successful, strong, and developed democracy, Ukraine as a democracy, is a huge threat for his uh, like regime in Russia. And this is a, 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 like exactly the reason why Russia is so aggressive towards Ukraine. It's not like, it's not regional conflict. It's not some, right. not NATO for sure. It's, it's only a reason why uh, Putin is trying to push and to attack Ukraine. The real reason, and it's very important to understand the real reason that Ukraine is a democracy. And this is attack not to Ukraine, not towards Ukraine, but towards democracy, towards Western world. Because our values in the Western world is a threat for Mr. Putin itself. Right. So, so why now? Why is the escalation taking place now? Um, Ukraine's been an electoral democracy for a while. And after the revolution in 2014, I, I think is consolidated in some ways and, and had a peaceful transition of power from one president to the other. Um, but that was two years ago. Why, why now? What do you think is going on that has caused Putin to be so aggressive all of a sudden? Um, you know, it's not now, Mike. Exactly, uh, it's not now. For Ukrainians, this now launch at least seven years, you know? Uh -huh. So we are, already, we are already in the war. So it's not, it, it's not something special uh, uh, for Ukrainians and for our country. It's not something special. We are scared. We are already uh, like prepared for almost everything. Yeah, here. But, and, and uh, Putin attacked Ukraine, invaded Ukraine seven years ago after right. uh, the revolution of dignity. It was a moment when Ukrainian nation, the third time, pushed back to some, like, one more strong man and right. uh, attempt uh, to capture uh, the power. So, and Putin understood at that time, and actually Putin supported Yunukovych, like now Putin supporting uh, Lukashenko. And uh, it was, Putin's choice, you know, and uh, when Yanukovych failed, uh, it was absolutely obvious that Putin lost his uh, influence uh, in Ukraine, and Ukraine will move uh, towards uh, European Union, towards uh, NATO, 
uh, away fast. And for Putin, it was, on the one hand, it was an excuse. On the other hand, it was a critical moment when he like, decided, and he perfectly knew because he worked uh, hard before Yanukovych uh, and, like escape, he worked hard to undermine uh, the capacity of our army because uh, the uh, chief, the minister of defense and the chief uh, of uh, SBU, like our special services was- That's like the equivalent of the FBI, just to for yeah. okay. Yeah, so, so Putin, uh, during the Yanukovych period of time, Putin and Kremlin, they were trying to control, directly control, uh, our Ministry of Defense, for example, so Mr. Lebedev, uh, before that it was Mr. Salamatian. So they controlled uh, these uh, like Ukrainian state bodies almost directly. And they perfectly knew that thanks to uh, the, their like destructive influence of their agents, uh, thanks to corruption, uh, they uh, almost destroyed the capacity and the uh, military potential of our forces. And Putin decided to invade Ukraine to destroy it like a country in existing borders. And Putin, um, I would remind you maybe, but Putin was trying to uh, annex at least the half of Ukraine. It's right. not, it, his goal wasn't only Crimea. His right. goal was Odessa, Kharkiv, Dnipropetrovsk. So Putin decided to divide Ukraine for like uh, their Ukraine, you know, pro-Russian Ukraine, a Sertarian Ukraine, and other Ukraine, some like European Ukraine, they divided. Right. For him, this concept of divided Ukraine was more or less okay because at, at least a half of this country, uh, like, could be, uh, he thought that it could be uh, under his direct uh, control. And he, it was his stake, actually. So, uh, and he failed, as uh, we perfectly know, because Ukrainian nation pushed back. And uh, like uh, civil society worked hard to create all this voluntary uh, military, uh, paramilitary uh, like organizations, units, and we pushed back as a nation, not only as a state. And, and that was a moment when Putin understood the, finally that he uh, like have lost Ukraine, you know, have lost uh, not, not only like economic party, but ideologically he lost because Ukrainians choose uh, uh, freedom. You know perfectly, you are the, maybe the best expert in the Western world uh, uh, towards Russia, and you perfectly know what happening now in uh, Russia. It's like an right. absolute nightmare uh, for yes. freedom. Yeah, and uh, and, and uh, maybe in somehow it, it's uh, even a worse situation than in late Soviet Union. So Putin is building the uh, one more empire of failure, you know, and Ukrainians will never live in these uh, circumstances. It's impossible. And that's why for them, Ukrainians are very um, like dangerous, dangerous example how people can fight and how people can sacrifice their lives to uh, fight for their freedom. Right. So do you think Putin plans to in escalate the war? I have almost said invade, and I think you rightly pointed out there's been a war going on since 2014, but do you think there's he plans to intervene in a greater way, or is he using this moment to seek concessions from Ukraine and the Europe and the and the West more broadly? Uh, Mike, I think that Putin is playing a more complicated game. Uh, it's not uh, about uh, direct military invasion because everyone uh, is expecting this invasion uh, at next uh, couple of months. So I think that the risk of the direct uh, um, like invasion is not very high, frankly speaking, but uh, it's, it's high enough to be prepared as prepared as possible because Mr. Putin for sure wants to invade what he wants and he's, he's trying to find 
the opportunity for it. And if he uh, will uh, like see an open door, you know he will enter this door. And, uh, and what's very important to understand, he is trying to shape the situation, to undermine the trust among countries, among people. And uh, for him, this is like, a, I don't know, salami tactics mixed uh, with uh, the tactics of uh, thousand cuts. You know, he's trying to uh, destabilize the situation, create a mess, create energy crisis, create migration crisis, uh, uh, like organized sabotages, coups, military, uh, like political murders, and so on and so forth. And for him, this buildup, it's only one element of this game to create one more additional crisis, to attract attention, and to create a situation when Western leaders should decide, should make a very hard decision. Because of course, Western countries don't wanna uh, like have a war, you know, nobody wants to be involved into the war and Ukrainian uh, like uh, don't want to be involved. And he is trying to show that guys, if I will attack, nobody will uh, protect you because all these fairy tales about values, it's just a fairy tale, you know? So the West is weak. The West is uh, uh, un uh, sincere, unsincere, because when they uh, tell you that values some matter something, uh, uh, it's a lie, uh, because for them, uh, the only value is the money. And there is no any democracy. Democracy is a fake, uh, it's like window dressing, you know? Right. And he's trying to uh, like to uh, underline, to show, to, to highlight this, this, his theory, his fake narrative by different examples, showing the weaknesses of democracy. And for him, the fact that uh, Western countries are not ready to fight uh, is a signal of weakness. Right. Is a signal of weakness. And uh, these guys and US uh, diplomat and uh, former ambassador to Russia perfectly understand that these guys understand only, only force, only power. So, uh, and if with the West will show them, and not only the West, so Ukraine and the West, it's like we should do it together, we will show him that he will have a strong pushback as. As, as we're capable to provide, uh, it, it's absolutely possible to, to uh, not to have a war, you know? Right. Well, tell us a couple last questions. Tell us how this is playing out inside Ukraine and domestic politics inside Ukraine. There's been some reports of conflict between President Zelensky and the, the so-called oligarchs. Is, is there's Obviously, as you mentioned already earlier, there's a Russian campaign to undermine democracy inside Ukraine that's not just troops on the border, but all kinds of instruments of influence inside Ukraine. Give our listeners a little sense of how what's happening in terms of domestic politics in Ukraine right now. Um, domestic politics is, uh, is complicated because Ukraine is a democracy and uh, like imperfect democracy, uh, we have a very tough uh, political competition. Um, um, Zelensky uh, really is trying to show that he's fighting against oligarch. So uh, I don't think that these attempts are very successful, frankly speaking. I think that it's uh, like, and he could play uh, more effectively and more efficient, but it's uh, it's it's only so um, it's only some shades of uh, like efficiency, if I may. So uh, of course he could be more efficient. Of course everything could be more uh, like better and so on and so forth. But in general, uh, now for sure in Ukraine the main uh, even domestic uh, question and the main topic in our agenda is possible Russian invasion. Uh, I talked to, to a lot of uh, like uh, people from our elite and political elite and I would say that they are worried but not scared. So nobody uh, wants to even even the most like pro-Russian you know so 
the closest uh, to uh, pro-Russian uh, political spectrum uh, politicians. They don't want, nobody wants to live in, 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 in Putin's Russia, you know, in, right. in, in, in those circumstances. Because we understand that we are a free country. And this right. might, uh, like uh, people has, uh, have uh, in St. Petersburg and in Moscow, it's just, uh, it's, it's incredible, absolutely. Uh, and uh, that's why, that's why uh, Putin don't have uh, alliance uh, inside uh, Ukrainian poly domestic politics, uh, except uh, Mr. Medvedchuk, uh, who is his relative, you know. So he is like, he's not oligarch, he's an agent of Russia on, uh, and uh, he's openly uh, uh, protect and to present uh, Kremlin's interests uh, in Ukrainian domestic politics. So- But that's it, just that one person, right? You would say. Uh, just Medvedchuk. one person. Just, just one person, just one person. Uh, and of course, it's there are some small uh, figures, some small like uh, uh, groups of people, but it's not uh, even significant. Uh, right. So in, inside Ukraine, he don't have, he don't have uh, like allies. Uh, this is the first uh, very important uh, stuff. But his propaganda is very strong, I would say. His propaganda. Right. A lot of people in Ukraine, especially in our southern uh, and uh, in uh, our uh, eastern part, uh, are still uh, watching all these uh, like Russian TVs, and uh, a lot of people brainwashed, I would say, and right. uh, and this is true, and this is a big uh, trouble and problem uh, here in Ukraine, but not only in Ukraine. Uh, Russia today is uh, very effective uh, and sharing all this propaganda uh, stuff uh, in Germany and even in Great Britain and even in the USA, you know. Perfectly. Even in the US, yes. They've, uh, so, they have some supporters of Putin's views. It's kind of amazing here in my country. So, so our elites worried, not scared, and for sure uh, Putin don't have a license out of our elites. Right. So my last question, given what you just described, uh, what do you think is the right policy response from uh, the Biden administration, NATO, Brussels? Uh, what do you think they should be doing? Uh, and maybe they're doing the right thing so far. What's your, what's your take on their response so far? Um, first of all, we should recognize that West, West uh, should recognize that uh, this is not regional conflict. This is not the, some small conflict between Ukraine and Russia, because it's not. This is, this is a war uh, against democracy. Uh, and Russia plays uh, and uh, um, play this uh, game and uh, has this war, uh, not only in Ukraine, but Ukraine is a main battlefield. It's a significant country for Russia. So uh, it's very important to recognize it that it's not a war between Russia and Ukraine, it's a war between concepts, between democracy and the totalitarian world, and Russia is most aggressive uh, like uh, actor uh, from that side now. Um, maybe not so dangerous as, as China is uh, in a middle and long-term perspective, but for sure much more aggressive now here tactically. Um, it's very important to uh, understand that Ukraine is already in way and Crimea already annexed. Right. And we and West missed time to uh, give a, a relevant answer already. Right. And we should fix this uh, this mistake because for for Putin it was a signal the weak reaction from the West was a signal that it is acceptable to act like this. And that's why Putin is raising stakes. And that's why Putin will raise a stake every next, uh, like, uh, every, every next year. So for him, it's very important to change the situation because now sanctions policy and general Western policy creates a situation when the time is playing against victim, not against aggressor. Because every year, every single year, uh, sanctions become 
less and less effective because Russian economy become like adopt uh, and uh, um, have this adaptation uh, to this so influence of them uh, become weaker and weaker, weaker every single year every year for Western politician it it becomes harder and harder to uh, remain these sanctions to support them to prolong them and every single year uh, this uh, situation, uh, this uh, event, for example, of annexation of Crimea becomes a historical event, not a political issue. And for sure, for Putin, uh, the strategy of Putin is to wait, but use all his resources to undermine his democratic opponents to make sure that the next politicians in the Western world will be more like more flexible, you know, uh, and maybe in a 10 years, in 15 years, when the uh, uh, annexation of Crimea event uh, will be already deep, deep history, uh, he will uh, find some um, and a trade off uh, with, with uh, the uh, next uh, generations of uh, democratic uh, leaders. And now he will play as strong law, uh, role as he, he can, as he capable to undermine democracy, to undermine trust between people, to make uh, the alliance uh, weaker. This is a uh, very understandable strategy, uh, divide and rule, you know? So now time is playing not against Russia and it creates a perfect circumstance for Mr. Putin to remain his aggressive, uh, like behavior. And he will raise the states, he will create an additional problems, still will time, till uh, the West will not turn the time against Russia. So uh, I th I th I'm sure that existing model of sanctions is not efficient and we should use new model uh, like smart or cascade sanctions when the EU uh, like adopt uh, a package of sanctions for some period of time, maybe five, seven, 10 years. And every next wave, every next package of sanction automatically will become like, will come to power if the problem is not solved. So right. every single day, price for aggressor should raise automatically. It, it right. shouldn't be a problem for politicians to continue sanctions or to make it uh, like uh, stronger. It's not. The solution should be uh, like uh, made uh, one time and create a perspective and uh, perception for investors for, uh, and the most important for Russian domestic political elites because they should understand that they will be in, uh, they will live in a 10 years, maybe in a five years, they will live in a total isolated country. And of course, it's, uh, uh, it's absolutely unacceptable. And this is uh, what we uh, need to uh, create. It in, uh, the the, the uh, like incentives for uh, internal pressure inside, inside Russia to uh, like stimulate the Russian elites to do something with uh, aggressive uh, behavior, abusive behavior of uh, Mr. Putin. This is a first uh, layer or pillar. Uh, the second pillar is of course to support uh, fragile democracies because these countries are paying a price for all Western uh, world. For example, this build up along our borders affects our economy. For Ukraine, the resources uh, becomes uh, uh, like more expensive, and it's like it's very it's very complicated. And it's very hard to have to achieve economic growth uh, when you have uh, a possible a war like tomorrow. Nobody will come to uh, invest uh, in your country, and your currency is not so stable. So it's. It's very, it's very complicated task to grow economy uh, if you have a possible war tomorrow, you know? And this is exactly what Putin uh, wants to have in Ukraine. The mess and uh, the, uh, like uh, this uh, like stable, uh, unsuccessful, 
uh, economy to show Russian people that, look, uh, if you will choose a democratic path, you will be so unsuccessful like Ukraine. And look what uh, is happening uh, like to Ukraine now. So uh, the support of fragile democracy is not because it's like morally correct choice. It's, right. it's reasonable because uh, West should share the risks uh, of this possible war with Ukrainian uh, and with Georgians and with other fragile democracies who are on the front line uh, with this uh, like dangerous, big, uh, aggressive uh, authoritarian states. Uh, it's, right. it's, it's reasonable, I believe. The third, uh, what's very important to uh, see, to have a normal representative here. So because here it's uh, even hard to imagine this, and I can't explain this, uh, that United States don't have ambassador in Kiev for at least two years. And this is a big signal that uh, if, uh, for example, uh, the ambassador to Belize already nominated and uh, ambassador to Kiev, to Ukraine is not, it's, 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 it's a signal for our elites that, okay, guys, we are not a priority, it looks like. So, and it's very strange signal and it's very big mistake, I believe. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and maybe uh, we discussed with you the idea of additional special bill anyway um, for democracy to, 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 to make sure that democracy is protected and to make sure that uh, ever since uh, um, like uh, possible uh, um, is done to, 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 to decrease the level of aggression, to um, not to have the additional war at least. So uh, these signals, uh, maybe symbolic signals, but still signals very important uh, to have now. And I believe that this combination between a new sanction policy to create additional pressure, but not actually pressure, but the right incentives, uh, to create the right incentives to turn the time against aggressor. And the second, the, the package, maybe even Marshall Plan, the package of support to fragile democracy who are on the front line uh, in this struggle understanding that it's not because of moral choice, it's not because it's moral or right, but because uh, these countries, those countries, they are paying additional price, additional, I believe, tax for democracy. They are, they are uh, it's like, it's a taxation, it's additional burdens uh, because uh, they uh, choose a democratic path. And uh, they do need, uh, and Ukraine do need uh, Western support uh, now, uh, maybe uh, like a, um, much bigger than they, we have now. Right. Well, those are some pretty clear ideas. I hope uh, Washington and Brussels are listening uh, to world class and listening to you, Alexei. Thanks for being on our program today. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, for your attention. You've been listening to World Class from the Freeman Swigley Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. If you like what you're hearing, please leave a review and be sure to subscribe on Apple, Simplecast, and SoundCloud to stay up to date on what's happening in the world and why.